Ladies and gentlemen, Road to Kona, welcome back. I am with Mike Riley. If you haven't heard, he's retiring. He's going to be out. <laughs> he's on his way out. He's had enough of us. So anyway, <laughs> Mike, I just want to welcome you to honor you. Uh, you've had, you are still having such an amazing career as an announcer, and you've kind of, you've redefined what that role really is and what it brings to people. Well, Mark, thank you know, coming from you, it's an honor. Uh, it, I've respected you and even from the sideline in 89, and I really didn't know you then. I'd met you in San Diego a couple of times, but you you were so zoned in. Uh, and to hear that come from you, that's that's an honor. So thank you. I, I don't know about redefining. You know, all I did was I'm Irish. I'm full of you know what. And I got on the microphone and all I wanted to do was make people happy. I, 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 yeah, that's just really what I wanted to do. How, how did you uh, first get into announcing at all? Oh, gosh, it was, uh, I don't know if you remember, but in motion, Lynn Flanagan. Uh, she she uh, was at a 10K race. She was the race director. And it was, I think it was 78. And I was going to run because I was running all the time, marathons. And uh, I had a bad hammy, but I went to the race anyway because friends were running it. Hmm. You know, people like Murphy. And so I figured I could just go and see him. Well, the race took off and she goes, what are you doing? I go, I got a bad hammy. I can't run. She goes, I got this microphone and, and, and this speaker. And it was one of those megaphone speakers on top of a pole, those old style things. Yeah. And I, I printed out the, the list of runners. I go, really? You printed it out? And she showed me a dot matrix printout. You know, with the pages, with the with the holes on the side. Remember that? Oh, yeah. And she goes, you know, everybody, why don't you call him? She handed me the mic. I go. And the first thing I thought of, Mark, I go, this is great. I can I can crank the guys coming in, give them a hard time about running too slow. And then I started calling people's names and I saw how they were looking and going, thanks. You know, and it just was very cool. And that's just kind of how it grew from there. Wow, very organic start to it then. Yeah. Definitely not something that was planned. <laughs> no, not at all. If if I'd have stayed injury free, who'd have known what had happened? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but were you one of those kids that w wanted to, you know, get in on the conversation, or were you pretty shy as a, a grown up? I was, I was a, you know, I was a little shy. I was the second firstborn. There was four, four in my family. I came along uh, eleven years later, and had a little sister. So I was a, little, I was aggressive. And, and but I'd get around people. I got shy until I got to high school and I was in a couple of plays and then mm. I it got into college and, and I don't know. I just like to talk. And then I got into Toastmasters when I my brother, older brother, got me into Toastmasters in San Diego as soon as I moved here in like 76. And I loved it, you know, giving speeches and everything. And so I, I never had a fear. I mean, I got nervous, but I never had a fear of grabbing a microphone and and talking to people. Well, clearly, uh, you have a knack for it. Obviously, you have touched so many people. If you so, you started in like the late seventies, calling some running races down there in San Diego. How, when? How did it transition? How did it turn out to be something that you ended up doing at Ironman at the World Championships? Well, well, San Diego. Obviously, you were a part of it. You know those early triathlons and the Bud Light, and I think it was the first ever professional triathlon. It was was that Solana Beach. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Tory uh, Pines. Uh, Tory Pines. I called that. Uh, I, I helped Murphy race direct it, and and I think it was Curl, uh, and and I called the race. And somebody says you just announced the first ever like pro triathlon. I go, oh, that's cool. Like like I figured it was the sport was going anywhere. You know, right. I was so ingrained into running, and so the triathlon thing just caught my bug, and I started doing them, and you know, going out trying to stay up with you guys on the. Was it the Tuesday run or the Wednesday run? The Wednesday ride, Tuesday yeah, run. The Tuesday run, the Wednesday ride. Yeah, I'd go out on the Tuesday run and try to hang. And I remember one time I was in really great shape and some took off and I hung back and I was right behind Tinley and Hullo came up to me and said, well, how, I didn't know you could run so fast. And I, that pissed me off. I go, what do you mean? I, I I can run. So we pounded the whole run and I couldn't walk for like two days the way we ran. So, <laughs> so yeah, I just, I love the community. I love the spirit of it. I just love swim, bike, run. And, and so how did, it, did you contact Ironman or how did that evolve? No, that evolved. Uh, it, you know, Mike Plant was the announcer over there and and I knew Mike very well here in San Diego. Uh, and then in 89, 
Valerie said to him, you know, you, you can't do this by yourself. You need help. So Mike called me and said, hey, Valerie wants somebody else to announce. You interested? I go, I don't know. I was going to do the race. I'm kind of training, you know, and mm. uh, the whole deal. And then finally she called and said, Mike, you sure you don't want to come over and I'll pay your airfare and stuff. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I already got that stuff. I've, I've already, you know, done it. And then she said, well, we'll pay you. And, and then she told me the dollar amount and I go, oh my gosh, I went and told Rose and she goes, seriously, they're going to pay you that. She goes, you can do that damn race anytime. You better go work. <laughs> I go, oh, okay. So, and, and the rest is history. I never got off the microphone. Uh, it, it just, it just, all of a sudden, 89 turned into, you know, this year. Well, 89 was a, that's a pretty good uh, year yeah. to go as your initiation year to be calling that race. Well, you know, having the running background when I was getting, remember, they were giving us splits from the course from the pay phones and mm. there was no car phones or anything like that. And somebody gave me your and Mark's split from, I think, mile two. And I go, you're freaking crazy. There's no way these guys are running this fast, you know? And when I told Mike plant, he goes, he just kind of shook his head. So then I got the split, I think at 5k or five miles. And I go, if this is true, they're keeping up the five, whatever pace I go. And, and finally somebody I knew at the halfway point, uh, gave me the split and, and they said, Mike, and I knew he was right. I go, Oh my gosh. So, uh, yeah, 89 Mark, <laughs> getting the splits on what you guys were running and then in my mind because i've i've blown up at marathons before i go mm -hmm. oh god wait till they hit 20 miles they're freaking <laughs> done they'll be going backwards you know <laughs> and then you kept it up i'm going holy crap this is amazing so yeah that first year was a heck of an introduction <laughs> wow and and so now here you are you, you've announced over a thousand races you, you put it out there on social media that you're re you're retiring from announcing that this will be your last Kona coming up, which is why I wore my Aloha shirt today. We wanted to honor your last time going coming up into Kona. New Zealand will be your final event that you'll call, period. Um, when, what's What's been the response from people? Overwhelming and daunting. Uh... Uh, yesterday morning, you know, Andy, my son works with me on a lot of social media and he goes, dad, I, I just went through about 500 messages. I can't keep doing this. I go, I'm going through some too. I said, but I want to see if I, I want to re you know, respond to people I know or I've known for years or mm. my sister called me this morning. She goes, you never answer me back. I'm going, Oh my gosh, my own, my own sister, because I couldn't get to it. I, I mean, it's well over three, 4,000 messages. And how many, I, I just, it, it's, it's overwhelming. And, and like always, Mark, they are writing me their journey, their story of mm. what they've gone through. And, you know, I, I guess they, they, they bring it to me because they either want it to be told or they want somebody to listen. And I, I've always listened and, and, you know, written a lot of them down and put them back out, you know, and obviously that's how the book came about. So, uh, it, it's overwhelming, but it's, it's, it's humbling. I'll tell you. <laughs> well, I think it's just a, a testament that shows that, um, you know, the way that you connect with people and you, you call them across the finish line. It's like I said, I think it's really redefined kind of what the role of an announcer can be. I mean, think of a lot of other races, people go, they cross the finish line, they go, they go home, they celebrate with their friends, but there's no, there's no connection right. with the, the person who's there, who's announcing the race. I mean, what do you think it is that's made what you do so special? I think I'm at the end of a very hard and long journey, as you know, and mm. so many people have backstories and overcoming the, the tough things in life. Uh, and, and when they come to that point, that final point at the finish line, it's just really they know it's just going to be me and them, even though their family of 10 could be right on the sideline or they could be watching from home, whatever it may be. They all of a sudden uh, know this connection is going to happen. And I do too. So I, I get to proclaim what they did and tell the world about it and, and say their name and, and just give them the glory that they deserve. So that, that's why, Mark, I think it's the connection. People come out, oh, I got to your voice at some point. I don't know what my voice sounds like. You know, it's, you, you don't know what your own voice sounds like, but 
people people want to hear it and mm. i do it as much for, for those athletes as i do for their families because mm. a lot of people sacrifice and you know with the athlete being gone a lot and everything for them to be a, a, an iron man athlete or, or a triathlete or anything and uh i'm giving that to their families too so i've always said it's i look at it so i don't get complacent and i don't hear myself being repetitive and getting mm. tired of it I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody just like you and I are right now, except it's at this place called a finish line where the dreams come true. Mm. So, uh, and, and that's how I look at it. And, and that's how everybody I, I, that's on a microphone should look at it because mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's, it's, yeah. And I think everybody feels that, that, that personal one-to-one, -one, just you saying their name as they cross the finish line, saying you are an Ironman, whatever whatever it is. And, and I've actually thought about this, like why why is it so special? Um, and as you know, somebody starts an Ironman day and when they finish, they're not the same person that they started the day as. No. And I think when you, when you say their name, it just takes that entire day and it solidifies it inside of them and they realize, I'm a different person because of what I did and because of your voice and calling out their name. It just, it's like the best, pre it's like, you know, they get their t-shirt, they get their medal, but yeah. they get their name said out loud to the world, to the universe. So some of the messages, uh, people played me the, their, their voicemail from their phone. And here it is me saying, Jimmy Brown, you are an Iron Man. You know, I said, I go, <laughs> Oh my gosh. So I, it, you're right. It's just that special moment in time that, you know what, that really can't be duplicated, even if they do more, especially on their first one. It just, I, I, it can't be duplicated. And and people have said to me afterwards, you know, Mike, uh, if I hadn't heard those words, I, I, I don't know what I'd do. I nothing would be complete. It'd be mm. like, and you know, in the first few years, Mark. 91 when i started saying 92 i wouldn't do it for i do you know four or five people then a bunch would come in i'd call their names and i started getting these messages from people uh people would mail me letters you didn't you didn't call me an iron man at at, at iron man lake placid <laughs> you didn't call him, how come you didn't you called the guy in front of me and the guy after and i'm thinking uh -oh. oh my gosh okay so every yeah everybody everybody deserves it you know they, they had to wake me up a little bit because it's just not something I thought you would do over and over and over again. It's funny. I tell spectators in the crowd at the beginning of big races, most all right, I go, Hey, you're going to hear us say things over here, up here, be repetitive, say them over and over again. But you know what? That athlete coming in is going to hear your applause for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they're going to hear what we say for the first time. Mm -hmm. So it's value. So just know that. And everybody shakes their head. Oh, okay. You know, mm -hmm. it's, I, I don't know if I created it, but I just know it was in front of me and I wanted to make sure we took advantage of it. <laughs> that, that's a that's a great uh, perspective that when that athlete crosses the line, that's the first time they've heard it all day. Us, we're, we're cheering. We've heard it, you know, a few times. That's OK. So let me I, I want to ask you some just announcer specific questions. So uh, how do you how do you get all the names right? Like I read some of the names and I'm like, oh, boy, this person coming in. I'd have no idea how to pronounce their name. I, I think it's just a matter of time. You know, I go through the bios about five or six times and the names before the race, I'm going through uh, a race now and, and I'll do that for Kona. And if I see a name that stumps me and, and I, I know the Hungarian names, the Polish names, I can get through all those Yugoslav, I can get through the, the Spanish names. And, but there's some that are actually like an American name could be said Two, way, two, two different ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll email them and, and send them. I go, hey, can you give this to me phonetically? And since I've been doing that, people will come up to me race week. Mike, you got your pad? Because I carry this. Now, this is how I say my name. I go spell it for me first. And they do. Wow. And I'll, I'll repeat it. And those, oh, my God, that's right. I go, that's what I would say. Or I'd say it incorrectly. No, it's pronounced like this. I'd write it down. And I got the notes in front of me. So I don't get them all correct but i i try to get as many as i it is funny when somebody like yourself stands up there and they're behind me and then there's a break they go how the heck did you say that name it's got like 14 letters in it <laughs> i don't know i don't that's, know <laughs> that's great that's great you i mean you're you're basically perfect but 
No. What was your biggest flub? Like, here comes the first woman, Jan Frodeno, or I don't know, whatever, whatever it would be. What would do you have any any that would be like, ooh, that was? Well, I've never, I've always feared if somebody was coming in, you know, like a, like a, like a, a rock and roll singer said, "Hello, Detroit," and he's in Cleveland, you know, that type of thing. I always feared that I would bring somebody in and say the incorrect name of them or say they're from the wrong place. So I actually go, okay, here comes John. Even though it's Jan Ferdino and I know where he lives and how old he is, I, I look at it right before I say it. So I don't, because a lot's going through my head. But at Ironman Lake Tahoe, the very first year, mm. and this had never happened, but I learned my lesson there. Uh, I said to the spotter out there, okay, is she still in first place? Yes. And is it this? Yes, she's still in first place. We, you got her, Mike. All right. Well, that was about a mile and a half out. She got passed. Oh. The winner came in. I called the second place. And as soon as I did it, the winner, she looks up at me like, what the? I go, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then I looked at the number, and, and then I'm, it, it, you know, I'm apologizing. You know, they can forgive you, but they never forget it, you know. If it's <laughs> so I, I learned my lesson there. But I've had some foo paws and. I, I usually, after I do something, I just make fun of myself. Oh my gosh, I couldn't get that one out. And because you're only human, you know, and right. you're going to make mistakes. That's why the live announcing is so much more difficult than sitting in a studio where they can edit, you know, you, yeah, once yeah, it's yeah, out you there, can't, you can't retake it. <laughs> it's out there, you know? And yeah. So you I, know, I, go ahead. Your, your days, um, you know, like an athlete, when they come to an Ironman, they're thinking, okay, I want to improve from whatever, 15 hours to 14 and a half right. or 12 to 11. Your day doesn't get any shorter. You're, you have the same <laughs> length day every single time you go out there. So for you, how, how, do, you, um, how do you define like, that was a great day for me? I, I did X, Y, and Z. And that was one of my best Ironmans ever. What is what is that great day? What is that improvement for you? The great day for me is a great event, a great energetic finish line. If mm. I can keep help keep the crowd there, if I can keep them motivated, you know, it's a long day to watch an Ironman. Yeah, it, I even tell them, all right, the winners are in. If your athlete's not coming in till nine o'clock, go get something to eat. Come on back and stay with us till midnight. And I'll see people, you know, uh, go and come back. Uh, but it's easy for me to stay motivated. People say, "How do you how do you do that all day long?" Well, what are you kidding me? I get to call him an Iron Man, everyone, and if, and if I was coming in or you were coming in and it was silent, could you imagine? That's a hmm. that's a bad dream to me. And I've had bad dreams like I couldn't get anything out at the finish line, like I used to in the day running a lot. I'd be somebody chasing me and I couldn't run, you know. And I, I have these that I would not be able to call out their name or say who they are. And one dream I had, and I'm looking around for the other announcer and everybody left me and nothing was coming out. I thought, I, I think I woke up, you know, laying on the floor after that one, but. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to ask you what, what is the announcer's bad dream nightmare that you wake up with sweats doing? And you just told me right there. That's, that's yeah. pretty funny. I never really had sweats about, like oversleeping because I wake up naturally. I, I know I wouldn't oversleep. Although for an award ceremony uh, about three, four years ago, I had, uh, I was riding. I did a century ride the weekend before, then went out with a bunch of buddies and got to the race. I think it was Wisconsin. And we were busy that week, did the race and the award ceremony, 9.30 the next morning. So I didn't get to sleep till like 1.32. And I go, all right, this is good. So I set the alarm but I said it an hour after I was supposed to get up just by oh. mistake. Well, the award started at nine 30 at, at uh, nine, like 15, my phone's ringing. I go, oh, there's my alarm. I look, it's Dave Downey from BCC. He goes, Hey Mike, uh, you're probably in the building, but I just want to <laughs> check. So we're going to start in 15 minutes and we have everything ready here. Your script we've got. And he knew, he knew my butt was still in bed. I go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dave, I'll be right there. I'm good. Oh my gosh. I, I ripped down there. I got down there in like 15 minutes. We started five minutes late, which is no big deal. And, and I was, I was sweating going up on that stage. Like how could you oversleep? <laughs> so, oh, geez. That's crazy. That happens. is wild. You know, you mentioned that, um, 
like for an athlete like Dave and I, you were you were you were waiting for mile 20 where we were gonna blow up and things were gonna be impossible. <laughs> Where is that point for you in an Ironman day as an announcer where it's like, okay, I got to hold it together. It seems impossible, but I know I'm going to get to that finish line of, of midnight or 17 hours. Where's that, that, where's the toughest point for you during the day? People always think it's like it, it, the last three hours from 10 to midnight. It, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm juiced by then. It's uh, the winners come in the first age groupers. And then all of a sudden it's, it's like 6.37 uh, and we're going and I know how many are still left out there and all that good stuff. And there's this lull because some of the spectators may leave and go to dinner, like I said, and stuff like that. So I'm trying to keep up. So I say to the, to the BCC, I go, I need some good hard music right now. Let it rip. And that's what, that kind of gets me back up. Uh, it's not that I'm not up when they finish and I call them out. It's just that I, I used to think, all right, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Oh my gosh, five more hours. Oh, but wow. uh, I don't do that anymore. I just go hour to hour. All right, it's seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. And then I'll see people like you come back and go, you still been doing this, haven't you? <laughs> I had I had a shower over there. I had, I go, I know. <laughs> yeah, one time well. Babbitt, one time Babbitt came up. He goes, it's like 10, 30 or 11. He goes, how you doing? I go, I'm doing great. He goes, so. You don't, you didn't take a break, did you? I go, no. I go, what'd you do? He smelled like soap. I go, get out of here. You took a shower. Get out of here. <laughs> uh, he cheated. He cheated. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, I had one last question I wanted to ask you. You've, you've been to so many finish lines. You've called so many people across. You've seen so many amazing stories. You've written about so many of them in, in your book and you talk about them on your podcast. Was there any finish that you saw where you couldn't hold it together, where it was just so emotional that, you know, the tears were coming down and, and your, your voice was, was, you know, shaky because it was, it touched you so deeply. The, the second year with Sarah Reinerson after she didn't finish the first year, I was actually talking to myself, Mark, before she, you know, and then I knew where she was at when she was coming in and mm -hmm. I was down on, on the finish line at that time. And I said to myself, hold it together. Don't, you know, you got to be the guy to hold it together. Let everybody else. And I did. And then I called her in. She went across the line and I was walking away. And all I heard, Sarah, thanks, Mike. And I just friggin' lost it. I just, it just mm -hmm. hit me like a brick. Oh my gosh. That little thank you from her of it just, I don't know. It just, it triggered something. And, uh, mm -hmm. I also talked to myself before my son, Andy, finished his Ironman. And I told Tom Zebart, I go, Tom, if there's somebody coming before or right after Andy, you got him. I'm, I, I, you know, it's almost like I wanted to apologize to that person because I wasn't going to call him an Ironman. But my boy was coming in, you know, mm. and uh, I held it together for him. Watched uh, Rose put the medal around his neck, his big sister, Aaron wrap them in a mylar blanket. And as they walked away, I wept like a, I turned away from the crowd, went to the stage on my backside. And I was like a little baby. I, I don't believe this. You know, there's the whole family. And, and it just was, it was tough. It was touching. And then mm -hmm. it was funny. z -Bar goes, oh, there's more coming, Mike. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, you go back into the, <laughs> into the mode because there's more people, more people coming. Wow. Those are, those are great moments. Great memories for you. I'm sure. All of you who are watching, if you've been called across by Mike, you know how amazing that is. You're going to have more time with your your grandchildren, your children, and uh, you are definitely going to be missed and remembered. But I know you're not going away. No, you know, you may get a knock on the door. There's Riley standing there. Hey, come on, let's go for a ride. I'll just come up to Santa Cruz and <laughs> just just show. You know, Rose and I keep talking should we buy a sprinter van and just go all over the place? You know, <laughs> who, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Great. Yeah. My son actually started a business. He's customizing oh. the inside of sprinter van so that no. people like you can go in luxury and go all over the U S go all over everywhere uh, you want to go. Canada, uh, I, drive up to Alaska, whatever you want and be in luxury. Yeah. Yeah. I would. Uh, where's he doing it out of? Uh, he's up in Truckee now. 
Oh, okay. Fantastic. Yeah, so. Well, tell him I said hello. I never, I just told the story the other day. Rose and I were talking about when I went to Ironman Australia, you were there with Matt and Andy was there. And Andy wow. was like 12 or 13. And Matt's was probably seven or eight. And Andy said, so he keeps following me around, Dad. I go, you just let him follow you around, take care of him. <laughs> him and, and uh, Luke Hannon, Graham Hannon's son. Wow. Andy and him. And they were always pulling mats around because we were staying in the same place. That was a great, I remember that vividly. And all of a sudden, I see Matt's years later, I go, oh my gosh, he's a man. You know, they grow up, don't they? <laughs> they do. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, Mike, congratulations on an amazing career announcing. Again, you've touched so many people. And uh, you've created a legacy of what several decades of calling people across the finish line, giving them that one to one where you're 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 there, they're there, they've completed it, they've completed that amazing journey. You've touched so many people. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it more than you know. And I got one more thing to say. The my ties are on you and Kona. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got the shirt. Ah, me too. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> We're ready. Ladies and gentlemen, road to Kona. If you're going to Kona, you got to be at the finish line and don't take a shower in between the first person and the last person. You got to, you know, help might feel like he's in, in some good company. Who cares if it's, it's outdoors? Doesn't yeah. matter. Okay. So Road to Kona, everybody, thanks for showing up, and we'll see you in Kona. And Mike, again, congratulations. Good luck with the remaining races that you have calling, and good luck at that final one in New Zealand. Aloha, Mark. Thank you very much.